Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Make sure my microphone is working. And just grab a sip of water if you don't mind. It's a bit cold, so I don't know if that will help or harm, but we'll, do the, we'll see. And I'll do my, my own stopwatch as well, so we'll be coordinated. Is that good? Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, I want to begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask him, God, please uh, have mercy on all of us here tonight. Guide our hearts, uh, give us an open mind, and uh, clear our thoughts of any misgiving, of any hatred uh, uh, towards uh, anyone else in this room. Let us have a free spirit of open conversation, of brotherhood in one humanity, and followers of the sister religions uh, of Abraham. Now, uh, to get onto our topic tonight, so our t subject is about Jesus, and is the New Testament picture of him uh, accurate? I'd like to start by, first of all, uh, say, uh, saying where the Quran stands on this, because although that is not our topic, uh, naturally, uh, folks will want to know, here is a Muslim, what's the Muslim perspective on this? So how does Jesus appear in the Quran? Uh, Jesus is said to have had a miraculous birth. Uh, he is shown to have performed many miracles, um, including healing the, the, the blind, curing the leper, even raising the dead. Uh, in the Quran, Jesus is shown to have uh, many important titles. Uh, for example, he's called Messiah of God, uh, which may be surprising to some of our Christian friends. Uh, he's called the Word of God and, and also Spirit of God. Jesus' message in the Quran uh, is said to be um, focused on uh, the idea that there is only one God, which is the message that, according to the Quran, was given by all of the prophets, uh, including Abraham and, and Moses and now uh, eventually Jesus. And uh, Jesus also spoke about following the straight path, which for Muslims uh, would mean uh, that he, as the Quran says, confirmed the law that was there before him, although the Quran shows that he uh, made some modification to some of the strictures of the law. So if on the one hand we conceive of a Judaism that is very strictly legalistic and we think of uh, some forms of Protestant Christianity that uh, does not uh, have much to do with the Old Testament law, uh, Muslims conceive of Jesus as being somewhere in between. And in fact, we think of Islamic law as, as ideally being somewhere in between as well, though in fact, as it turns out in many Muslim countries, Islamic law comes to be interpreted in a very strict manner closer to Judaism. But in, on my reading of the Quran, it should be a balance. So that is what would be called the straight path. Uh, now, on these two points regarding Jesus' message, uh, this is where uh, Muslims will find that uh, the New Testament obviously gives a slightly different picture. And uh, it is interesting that historians of religion, uh, and not Muslims, and mainly coming from a Christian background, uh, often say that Jesus did not claim divinity for himself, and that to understand Jesus, we have to understand essentially that he came from a Jewish milieu. Uh, so the, the Gospels, as you know, testify to the fact that his, he was circumcised on the eighth day, and uh, other practices that are known from Judaism were followed by Jesus' mother, and also eventually by Jesus, and even after him, by his disciples and close companions, as one would uh, uh, find in the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible. So these are two key components regarding the historical Jesus uh, that uh, I will find that the New Testament uh, does, uh, does not actually quite uh, uphold. So let's go to the uh, New Testament. But before we do that, I, I want to say something about the Quran's view of the Bible. On the one hand, the Quran speaks very respectfully about the Bible, about the Torah, about the Gospel, about the Psalms, and, and, and speaks about these books as containing revelation from God and light and guidance. At the same time, the, the Quran, in a few passages, points out that not all of the Bible is to be believed. Some things the Quran is indicating in this verse that I mentioned here, Quran Surah 2, verses 75 to 79, uh, some books were written by people who just simply claimed uh, divine inspiration uh, without uh, sufficient authority for that. 
Uh, and secondly, uh, of course, this is the Quran's view. I'm, I'm just explaining the view. I, I, I know some Christian folks here will be thinking, well, that's not true. Uh, and, and we'll see later on if that could be true or not. But for the moment, I'm just explaining the Quran's position so you can understand uh, where the Quran is uh, entering this discourse and, and where the Muslim is coming from. So there's also a passage here in Surah 3, verses uh, 78 to 80, uh, which uh, repudiates the idea that Jesus claimed divinity. Uh, so with these passages in mind, Muslims, in reading the Bible, would try to differentiate between uh, those passages which clearly come from divine authority and those passages which perhaps uh, made the claim without proper authority from God and those passages which uh, seem to indicate that Jesus is making a claim for himself that the Quran would not uh, accept. So to move on now uh, further, there is a book that explains the Quran's position on this uh, most clearly, a book entitled The Bible in Arabic by Sidney Griffith. And uh, this book, uh, I, I find an important uh, part of modern discourse regarding the Quran's view on the Bible. Because for a long time, many Christian missionaries had tried to portray the idea that the Quran is somehow self-contradictory. On the one hand, it seems to be acknowledging that the Bible is such a good book. And then on the other hand, the Quran teaches things which are different from what the Bible teaches. And therefore, the Quran must be wrong by its own standards, uh, approving the book and yet uh, differing from it. Uh, but uh, Sidney Griffiths has pointed out that the Quran is very clear uh, that the previous scriptures uh, contain some mistakes and, and misunderstandings, and the Quran has come to correct that picture that was there previously. So let's move on then and look at Jesus in the Bible, more particularly the New Testament, which is the subject of tonight's debate. So I'd like to give an example of, of what we find. Uh, did the companions of Paul hear the voice when Paul was said to be on the road to Damascus and Jesus appeared to him as a bright light? So uh, we want to compare Acts chapter 9, verse number 7 with Acts chapter 22, verse number 9. And comparing these, we will find that in the uh, chapter 9 verse, uh, those with Paul did hear a voice, but in the 22nd chapter, uh, the, those who were with Paul did not hear the voice. Now that's my uh, poor summary of the, uh, of the verses in question. Let's look at the actual verses. And uh, uh, I have to beg your pardon here because I know many folks here are uh, very interested in using the King James Version of the Bible, but, but pardon me because my English is not that good and uh, I have to rely on the New King James Version because it's put in, in modern English. So here you have it. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless hearing a voice, but seeing no one. That's Acts chapter 9. Then we go to chapter 22. And those who were with me, Paul says, indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So either they heard in Acts chapter 9, or they didn't hear, hear in Acts chapter 22. So here we have a difficulty with accepting the documents as they are. Again, the passages are Acts chapter 9, verse 7, Acts chapter 22, verse number 9. Let's move on to another example. Now, here I want to look at the date of Jesus' ascension. Uh, Muslims do actually believe that Jesus ascended into heaven. The Quran says so in Surah 4, uh, verse number 158. Uh, how and, and when, uh, the Quran does not specify. But Muslims would be uh, willing to accept the narratives that are here uh, in the Christian Bible. But which one are we to accept uh, as to the date of the ascension? In Luke, uh, we have it that Jesus ascended on Easter evening, and in Acts of the Apostles, 40 days uh, later. That is repeated in my oncoming slide. Uh, so Easter evening in, in the Gospel according to Luke, and 40 days uh, after Easter in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, both of these documents are written by the same individual. You can check it out yourself. Uh, the ver relevant verses are Luke chapter 24, verse number 51, and then uh, Acts of the Apostles. Can we get to Acts of the Apostles? Hello. Okay. Uh, chapter 1, verse number 9. So we cannot have it on, on the two different dates. You, you can, of course, have Jesus ascending, coming back, uh, dwelling with his disciples some more, and then ascending one more time. But that's not the, the, the character of the narratives. The, uh, Luke's gospel seems to close it off. That's it. He has uh, appeared to his disciples, 
this looks like the end of the matter, and then the disciples go back to praising God in the temple. Uh, so, case is closed. Then, Acts of the Apostles, case is reopened. Now we have the space for Jesus to appear to his disciples over a period of 40 days. Uh, and so, the, the story is expanded and is made more Christian with the retelling. It, more evidence is given of Jesus appearing to his disciples, not once or twice, but now over a period of uh, 40 days. So it, it does actually transform over time. Now let's look at another example regarding Jesus' genealogy. So uh, Thomas has given us uh, a lot of uh, ancient testimony uh, saying that Jesus, uh, Matthew wrote uh, uh, the gospel according to Matthew and he was a disciple of Jesus and so on. But notice that he started with Papias who was writing in the middle of the second century. And, and he himself, uh, in a way, challenged me to come back and give evidence from the first century onwards. But he didn't give any evidence from the first century of anyone who said that Matthew wrote this gospel. He came with Papias to begin with from the second century and then went on to Irenaeus and, and so on. But now let's look at the actual content to see if this uh, person was writing uh, a, a scripture that is infallible, inerrant, uh, that we should trust in every respect. And I know the, uh, the example I'm going to give here is somewhat trite. One might say in the end, who, who cares about these uh, details? The main thing we want to know about is whether Jesus died for us and, and rose from the dead. Uh, but, but in order to get there, we have to start with the basics and, and look at uh, real evidence to see whether or not these uh, writers of, of the material before us actually were writing infallible and inerrant scripture. And uh, if they were just writing as ordinary individuals, giving us some history that they, that they knew, we can evaluate it from that perspective as, as well. So let's see what we find. We want to compare Matthew with First Chronicles in the Old Testament. Uh, so you would expect that the New Testament writers want to conform to the Old Testament, and that's the whole basis of Christianity. Without the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament doesn't have any grounding. So the New Testament has to agree with the Old Testament. So does Matthew agree with First Chronicles? Now, in Matthew's uh, rendering, we have the genealogy of Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. And we want to compare that with 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. Um, my clicker is on a delay mode or something like this. Hello. Hello, clicker. There we go. So, we want to look at these three names in Matthew's uh, gospel in those uh, uh, verses that I mentioned. And look at the, 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 name start, the, the, the list starting with Joram and ending with Jotham. You can see that there is only one generation between Joram and Jotham. Now we go to 1 Chronicles and we see that between Joram and Jotham, there are actually four generations. And uh, it's possible that this person, Uzziah, is the same as Ahaziah. Uh, but then we still have three <coughs> additional names. So how did Matthew get a shorter list like this? Now, Matthew makes a point about his list. He says, so there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, and then 14 generations from David to the, uh, uh, to the exile, uh, and, and then uh, 14 generations from the exile uh, to Jesus. So he wants a nice list of 14 plus 14 plus 14. The significance of this number has been discussed by scholars in the commentaries, and I don't want to uh, delay us uh, with, with that significance, but, but the point is that Matthew wants it to be 14. And in order for it to be 14, apparently he found it convenient to omit three names from the genealogical record, as was already there in the Old Testament. So he has a nice list of 14, but he has truncated uh, the list. He's given us misinformation. Uh, here, unfortunately. So, uh, here is the text as it reads, uh, still in my truncated form, uh, to, just to get to the root of the matter. Jo Joram begat Uzziah, Uzziah begat uh, jo Jotham, that's Matthew's gospel, but then when we go to the first chronicles, it's Joram his son, Ahaziah his son, Joash his son, a a Amaziah his son, Arariah his son, Jotham his son, and that's the list given in first chronicles. So, uh, that's a difficulty. Again, the passages are Matthew chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. You can look it up yourself. And 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. I have to move on. Another example. Okay, Jesus' empty tomb is being discovered. 
And we want to compare now Matthew's gospel with uh, John's gospel. Yeah, I think I got this figured out. If I point it towards the computer, it works, okay? Line of sight. Uh, so Matthew compared with John. So let's uh, look at Matthew chapter 28 and compare that with uh, John uh, chapter 20. John chapter 20, can you come up please? Yeah, there you are. All right, so uh, let's read Matthew chapter 28, starting with verse number one. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for... An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Now Matthew has a very dramatic scene here. You can imagine the women coming towards the tomb and, and behold, the angel comes down. He, he rolls away the stone. He sits on the stone. Um, there is more, but let's compare that with John because there's only so much I can fit on a screen. Uh, now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, this is a very different narrative. In John's gospel, the stone had already been taken away from the, stu from, from the tomb. That's before Mary even got there. But Matthew's gospel has Mary see the rolling stone. The, the, the angel came down and rolled the stone away like almost as Mary is, uh, is approaching. Now, uh, Matthew will go on to tell us about the guards at the tomb and how they responded and so on. So Matthew has guards at the tomb. Why does he have guards at the tomb? To make sure that nobody can interfere with the body and take the body away and then say that Jesus resurrected from the dead. So once you come there and you find that there are guards at the tomb, you know that nobody has stolen the body. So what's Mary's reaction now? The angel speaks to Mary and tells her uh, what to do in, in, uh, in Matthew's gospel and explains what has happened. Jesus has uh, arisen. He's not here. So now Mary knows. Jesus is resurrected from the dead, right? But that's Matthew's gospel. Let's go to John's gospel. Continuing with uh, Mary, um, then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Why would she say something like that? If she came and saw the rolling stone, she saw the angel, the angel told her what to do. More, more than this, on the way, as, they, as she was going to talk to the disciples, Jesus himself appeared to Mary and to her female companion, and, and, and they, they, they held him and worshipped him. That's Matthew's gospel. But in John's gospel, the story is very different. She doesn't know what has happened. And she thinks that somebody has stolen the body. These two stories are so incompatible uh, that, that uh, James Dunn, remember James Dunn? He's the last scholar that uh, uh, Thomas uh, mentioned in support of, of what he was saying about the authorship of the gospel material and, and, the new t and the formation of the creed that says that Jesus was raised from the dead. James uh, Dunn is worth citing. He is a great scholar. And, and I'll come back to say more about the formation of that creed. But James Dunn himself has pointed out uh, the, the, the kinds of discrepancies that I'm mentioning before you here. I didn't invent these because I'm a Muslim. This is what Christian scholars James Dunn and others are pointing out that are there in what we will call now the historical record. So what we find in, in essence then, and in sum, uh, I'll just finish with this with one slide. So the passages that are relevant here, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 2, and you can read further than that, but the ones I compared uh, is with John uh, chapter 20, verses number 1 uh, to 2. What is important as a... Uh, as a conclusion to all of this, is to recognize that, in fact, even though the Gospels were written uh, towards the end of the first century, and notice that Thomas didn't give any dates as to when these Gospels were written, what they give us is not the actual history, the blow-by-blow -blow moments that happened in the life of Jesus. Sure, they might have told us some, some historical details, 
But you have that in historical fiction as well. The story itself may be fictional, but it's set in a historical circumstance, and you can check the historical details. Yes, this city did exist, and this building did exist, and that archaeological artifact conforms to some a piece of the story. But we're asking, does the presentation of Jesus match what actually happened in the life of Jesus? And the answer to that is no. What we find in the Gospel records is that, and in the rest of the New Testament, is that the story of Jesus is being transformed so as to make him into a God and to make him a non-Jew so that he does not have to follow the law and his Christian followers do not have to follow the law either. Thank you very much.